Chapter 31 of the Epistle of St. Paul to the Romans by Hanley Mole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Roman Christianity, St. Paul's Commission, his intended itinerary, he asks for prayer. Romans 15, 14 to 33. The epistle hastens to its close. As to its instructions, doctrinal or moral, they are now practically written. The way of salvation lies extended in its radiant outline before the Romans and ourselves. The way of obedience in some of its main tracks has been drawn firmly on the field of life. Little remains but the missionary's last words about persons and plans, and then the great task is done. He will say a warm, gracious word about the spiritual state of the Roman believers. He will justify with a noble courtesy his own authoritative attitude as their counsellor. He will talk a little of his hoped-for and now seemingly approaching visit and matters in connection with it. He will greet the individuals whom he knows and commend the bearer of the letter and add last messages from his friends. Then Phoebe may receive her charge and go on her way. Verse 14. But I am sure, my brethren, quite on my own part, about you, that you are yourselves irrespective of my influence, brimming with goodness, with high Christian qualities in general, filled with all knowledge, competent, in fact, to admonish one another. Is this flattery, interested and insincere? Is it weakness, easily persuaded into a false optimism? Surely not, for the speaker here is the man who has spoken straight to the souls of these same people about sin and judgment and holiness, about the holiness of these everyday charities which some of them, so he has said plainly enough, had been violating. But a truly great heart always loves to praise where it can, and discerningly to think and say the best. He who is truth itself said of his imperfect, his disappointing followers, as he spoke of them in their hearing to his father, They have kept thy word, I am glorified in them. John seventeen six and 10. So here his servant does not indeed give the Romans a formal certificate of perfection, but he does rejoice to know and to say that their community is Christian in a high degree, and that in a certain sense they have not needed information about justification by faith, nor about principles of love and liberty in their intercourse. In essence, all has been in their cognizance already, an assurance which could not have been entertained in regard of every mission, certainly. He has written not as to children, giving them an alphabet, but as to men, developing facts into science. Verse 15 to verse 16. But with a certain boldness I have written to you here and there, just as reminding you, because of the grace, the free gift of his commission, and of the equipment for it, given me by our God, given in order to my being Christ Jesus' minister, sent to the nations, doing priest work with the gospel of God, that the oblation of the nations, the oblation which is in fact the nations self-laid upon the spiritual altar, may be acceptable, consecrated in the Holy Spirit. It is a startling and splendid passage of metaphor, here, once, in all the range of his writings, unless we accept the few and affecting words of Philippians 2.17, the apostle presents himself to his converts as a sacrificial minister and a priest, in the sense which usage, not etymology, has so long stamped on that English word as its more special sense. Never do the great founders of the church, and never does he who is its foundation use the term iarevs, sacrificing, mediating priest, as a term to designate the Christian minister in any of his orders, never, if this passage is not to be reckoned in, with its ierochin, its priest work, as we have ventured to translate the Greek. In the distinctively sacerdotal epistle, the Hebrews, the word ierevs comes indeed into the foreground, but there it is absorbed into the Lord. It is of the blessings which his great offering won. It is appropriated altogether to him in his self-sacrificial work once done, and in his heavenly work now always doing, the work of mediatorial impartation from his throne, of the blessings which his great offering won. One other Christian application of the sacrificial title we have in the epistles, Ye are a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood, 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9, but who are ye? not the consecrated pastorate, but the consecrated Christian company altogether. And what are the altar sacrifices of that company? 
sacrifices spiritual, the praises of him who called them into his wonderful light, 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9. In the Christian church, the pre-Levitical idea of the old Israel appears in its sacred reality. He who offered to the church of Moses, Exodus 19.6, to be one great priesthood, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, found his favoured nation unready for the privilege, and so Levi representatively took the place alone. But now, in his new Israel, as all are sons in the son, so are all priests in the priest. And the sacred ministry of that Israel, the ministry which is his own divine institution, the gift, Ephesians 4.11, of the ascended Lord to his church, is never once designated as such by the term which would have marked it as the analogue to Levi or to Aaron. Is this passage in any degree an exception? No, for it contains its own full inner evidence of its metaphorical cast. The priest working here has regard, we find, not to a ritual but to the gospel. The oblation is the nations. The hallowing element, shed as it were upon the victims, is the Holy Ghost. Not in a material temple and serving at no tangible altar, the apostle brings his multitudinous converts as his holocaust to the Lord. The Spirit at his preaching and on their believing descends upon them, and they lay themselves a living sacrifice where the fire of love shall consume them to his glory. Verse 17, I have therefore my right to exaltation in Christ Jesus as his member and implement as to what regards God, not in any respect as regards myself apart from him. And then he proceeds as if about to say in evidence of that assertion that he always declines to intrude on a brother apostle's ground and to claim as his own experience what was in the least degree another's, but that indeed through him in sovereign grace God has done great things far and wide. This he expresses thus in energetic compressions of diction. Verse 18 to verse 19. For I will not dare to talk at all of things which Christ did not work out through me, there is an emphasis on me, to affect obedience of the nations to his gospel by word and deed in power of signs and wonders in power of God's spirit, a reference strangely impressive by its very passingness to the exercise of miracle working gifts by the writer. This man, so strong in thought, so practical in counsel, so extremely unlikely to have been under an illusion about a large factor in his adult and intensely conscious experience, speaks direct from himself of his wonderworks. And the illusion, thus dropped by the way and left behind, is itself an evidence to the perfect mental balance of the witness. This was no enthusiast, intoxicated with ambitious spiritual visions, but a man put in trust with a mysterious yet sober treasure so that from Jerusalem and round about it, Acts 26, verse 20, as far as the Illyrian region, the highland seaboard, which looks across the Adriatic to the long eastern side of Italy, I have fulfilled the gospel of Christ, carried it practically everywhere, satisfied the idea of so distributing it that it shall be accessible everywhere to the native races. Verse 20 to verse 24. But this I have done with this ambition, to preach the gospel not where Christ was already named, that I might not build on another man's foundation, but to act on the divine word, as it stands written, Isaiah 52, verse 15, They to whom no news was carried about him shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. He was an ambition as far-sighted as it was noble. Would that the principle of it could have been better remembered in the history of Christendom, and not least in our own age. A wasteful overlapping of effort on effort, system on system, would not need now to be so much deplored. Thus, as a fact, I was hindered, for the most part. Hindrances were the rule, signals of opportunity the exception. In coming to you, you whose city is no untrodden ground to messengers of Christ, and therefore not the ground which had a first claim on me. But now, as no longer having place in these regions, Eastern Roman Europe yielding him no longer an unattempted and accessible district to enter, and having a homesick feeling for coming to you, these many years, whenever I may be journeying to Spain, I will come to you. For I hope on my journey through to see the sight of you, Theasus there, as if the view of so important a church would be a spectacle indeed, and by you to be escorted there, if first I may have my fill of you, however imperfectly. 
As always, in the fine courtesy of pastoral love, he says more and thinks more of his own expected gain of refreshment and encouragement from them than even of what he may have to impart to them. So he had thought and so spoken in his opening page, one eleven and 12. It is the same heart throughout. How little did he realize the line and details of the destined fulfillment of that homesick feeling. He was indeed to see Rome, and for no passing sight of the scene. For two long years of sorrows and joys, restraints and wonderful occasions, innumerable colloquies, and the writing of great scriptures, he was to dwell in his own hired lodgings there. But he did not see what lay between. For St. Paul ordinarily, as always for us, it was true that we know not what awaits us. For us, as for him, it is better to walk with God in the dark than to go alone in the light. Did he ultimately visit Spain? We shall never know until perhaps we are permitted to ask him hereafter. It is not at all impossible that, released from his Roman prison, he first went westward and then, as at some time he certainly did, travelled to the Levant. But no tradition, however faint, connects St. Paul with the great peninsula, which glories in her legend of St. James. Is it irrelevant to remember that in his gospel he has notably visited Spain in later ages? It was the gospel of St. Paul, the simple grandeur of his exposition of justification by faith, which in the 16th century laid hold on multitudes of the noblest of Spanish hearts, till it seemed as if not Germany, not England, bid fairer to become again a land of truth in the light. The terrible Inquisition utterly crushed the springing harvest at Valladolid, at Seville, and in that ghastly quemadero at Madrid, which, five and twenty years ago, was excavated by accident to reveal its deep strata of ashes and charred bones, and all the debris of the autos. But now again... In the mercy of God, and in happier hours, the New Testament is read in the towns of Spain, and in her highland villages, and churches are gathering around the holy light, spiritual descendants of the true, the primeval, Church of Rome. May the God of hope fill them with all peace and joy in believing. Verse 25 to verse 27. But now I am journeying to Jerusalem the journey whose course we know so well from Acts 20 and 21, ministering to the saints, serving the poor converts of the holy city as the collector and conveyor of alms for their necessities. For Macedonia and Archaea, the northern and southern provinces of Roman Greece, finally personified in this vivid passage, thought good to make something of a communication, a certain gift to be shared among the recipients, for the poor of the saints who live at Jerusalem the place where poverty seemed specially for whatever reason to beset the converts. For they thought good. Yes, but there is a different side to the matter. Macedonia and Archaea are generous friends, but they have an obligation too. And debtors they are to them, to these poor people of the old city. For if in their spiritual things the nations shared, they, these nations, are in debt as a fact, in things carnal, things belonging to our life in the flesh, to minister to them. Liturgese, to do them public and religious service. Verse 28 to verse 29. When I have finished this then and sealed this fruit to them, put them into ratified ownership of this proceed of Christian love, I will come away by your road to Spain. He means, if the Lord will. It is instructive to note that even St. Paul does not make it a duty with an almost superstitious iteration always to say so. Now I know that, coming to you in the fullness of Christ's benediction, I shall come. He will come with his Lord's benediction on him as his messenger to the Roman disciples. Christ will send him charged with heavenly messages and attended with his own prospering presence. And this will be in fullness with a rich overflow of saving truth and heavenly power and blissful fellowship. Here he pauses to ask them for that boon of which he is so covetous, intercessory prayer. He has been speaking with a kind and even sprightly pleasantry. There is no irreverence in the recognition of those personages, Macedonia and Archaea, and their gift, which is also their debt. He has spoken also of what we know from elsewhere, 1 Corinthians 16, to 4 to have been his own scrupulous purpose not only to collect the alms, but to see them punctually delivered above all suspicion of misuse. He has talked with cheerful confidence of the road by Rome to Spain, 
but now he realizes what the visit to Jerusalem involves for himself. He has tasted in many places and at many times the bitter hatred felt for him in unbelieving Israel. A hatred the more bitter, probably, the more his astonishing activity and influence were felt in region after region. Now he is going to the central focus of the enmity, to the city of the Sanhedrin and of the Zealots. And St. Paul is no stoic, indifferent to fear, lifted in an unnatural exaltation above circumstances, though he is ready to walk through them in the power of Christ. His heart anticipates the experiences of outrage and revilings, and the possible breaking up of all his missionary plans. He thinks too of prejudice within the church, as well as of hatred from without. He is not at all sure that his cherished collection will not be coldly received, or even rejected, by the Judaists of the Mother Church, whom yet he must and will call saints. So he tells all to the Romans, with a generous and winning confidence in their sympathy, and begs their prayers, and above all sets them praying, that he may not be disappointed of his longed-for visit to them. All was granted, he was welcomed by the church, he was delivered from the fanatics by the strong arm of the empire. He did reach Rome, and he had holy joy there. Only the Lord took his own way, a way they knew not, to answer Paul and his friends. Verse 30 to verse 33. But I appeal to you, brethren, the but carries an implication that something lay in the way of the happy prospect just mentioned, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, by that holy family affection inspired by the Holy One into the hearts which he has regenerated, to wrestle along with me in your prayers on my behalf to our God, that I may be rescued from those who disobey the gospel in Judea, and that my ministration, which takes me to Jerusalem, may prove acceptable to the saints, may be taken by the Christians there without prejudice and in love, that I may with joy come to you through the will of God, and may share refreshing rest with you, the rest of holy fellowship where the tension of discussion and opposition is intermitted, and the two parties perfectly understand one another in their Lord. But the God of our peace be with you all. Yes, so be it, whether or no the longed-for joy and refreshing rest is granted in his providence to the Apostle. With his beloved Romans, anywise, let there be peace, peace in their community and in their souls, peace with God and peace in him. And so it will be, whether their human friend is or is not permitted to see them, if only the eternal friend is there. There is a deep and attractive tenderness, as we have seen above in this paragraph, where the writer's heart tells the readers quite freely of his personal misgivings and longings. One of the most pathetic, sometimes one of the most beautiful phenomena of human life, is the strong man in his weak hour, or rather in his feeling hour, when he is glad of the support of those who may be so much his weaker. There is a sort of strength which prides itself upon never showing such symptoms, to which it is a point of honour to act and speak always, as if the man were self-contained and self-sufficient. But this is a narrow type of strength, not a great one. The strong man, truly great, is not afraid in season to let himself go. He is well able to recover. An underlying power leaves him at leisure to show upon the surface very much of what he feels. The largeness of his insight puts him into manifold contact with others and keeps him open to their sympathies, however humble and inadequate these sympathies may be. The Lord himself, mighty to save, cared more than we can fully know for human fellow feeling. Will ye also go away? Ye are they that have continued with me in my temptations. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Lovest thou me? No false spiritual pride suggests it to St. Paul to conceal his anxieties from the Romans. It is a temptation sometimes to those who have been called to help and strengthen other men, to affect for themselves a strength which perhaps they do not quite feel. It is well meant. The man is afraid that if he owns to a burden, he may seem to belie the gospel of perfect peace, that if he even lets it be suspected that he is not always in the ideal Christian frame, his warmest exhortations and testimonies may lose their power. But at all possible hazards, let him, about such things as about all others, tell the truth. It is a sacred duty in itself. The heavenly gospel has no corner in it for the maneuvers of spiritual prevarication. And he will find assuredly that truthfulness, transparent candor, will not really discount his witness to the promises of his Lord.
It may humiliate him, but it will not discredit Jesus Christ. It will indicate the imperfection of the recipient, but not any defect in the thing received. And the fact that the witness has been found quite candid against himself, where there is occasion, will give a double weight to his every direct testimony to the possibility of a life lived in the hourly peace of God. It is no part of our Christian duty to feel doubts and fears, and the more we act upon our Lord's promises as they stand, the more we shall rejoice to find that misgivings tend to vanish where once they were always thickening upon us, only it is our duty always to be transparently honest. However, we must not treat this theme here too much as if St. Paul had given us an unmistakable text for it. His words now before us express no carking care about his intended visit to Jerusalem. They only indicate a deep sense of the gravity of the prospect and of its dangers. And we know from elsewhere, see especially Acts 21.13, that that sense did sometimes amount to an agony of feeling in the course of the very journey which he now contemplates. And we see him here quite without the wish to conceal his heart in the matter. In closing, we note for our learning his example as he is a man who craves to be prayed for. Prayer, that great mystery, that blessed fact and power, was indeed vital to St. Paul. He is always praying himself. He is always asking other people to pray for him. He has seen Jesus Christ our Lord. He is his Lord's inspired minister and delegate. He has been caught up into the third heaven. He has had a thousand proofs that all things infallibly work together for his good. But he is left by this as certain as ever, with a persuasion as simple as a child's, and also as deep as his own life-worn spirit, that it is immensely well worth his while to secure the intercessory prayers of those who know the way to God in Christ. End of chapter 31。Chapter 32 of the Epistle of St. Paul to the Romans by Handley Mole。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。A commendation, greetings, a warning, a doxology. Romans 16, 1 to 27. Once more, with a reverent license of thought, we may imagine ourselves to be watching in detail the scene in the house of Gaius. Hour upon hour has passed over Paul and his scribe, as the wonderful message has developed itself, at once and everywhere the word of man and the word of God. They began at morning, and the themes of sin and righteousness and glory, of the present and the future of Israel, of the duties of the Christian life, of the special problems of the Roman mission, have carried the hours along to noon, to afternoon. Now to the watcher from the westward lattice, slow sinks more lovely ere this race be run, along Moria's hills the setting sun, not as in northern climes obscurely bright, but one unclouded blaze of living light. The apostle, pacing the chamber as men are wont to do when they use the pens of others, is aware that his message is at an end as to doctrine and counsel. But before he bids his willing and wondering secretary rest from his labors, he has to discharge his own heart of the personal thoughts and affections which have lain ready in it all the while, and which his last words about his coming visit to the city have brought up in all their life and warmth. And now Paul and Tertius are no longer alone. Other brethren have found their way to the chamber, Timotheus, Lucius, Jason, Sosipater, Gaius himself, Quartus, and no less a neighbor than Erastus, treasurer of Corinth. A page of personal messages is yet to be dictated from St. Paul and from his friends. Now first, he must not forget the pious woman who is, so we surely may assume, to take charge of this inestimable packet and to deliver it at Rome. We know nothing of Phoebe but from this brief mention. We cannot perhaps be formally certain that she is here described as a female church official, a deaconess, in a sense of the word familiar in later developments of church order, a woman set apart by the laying on of hands, appointed to inquire into and relieve temporal distress, and to be the teacher of female inquirers in the mission. But there is at least a great likelihood that something like this was her position, for she was not merely an active Christian, she was a ministrant of the church. She was certainly as a person worthy of reliance and of loving commendatory praise, 
now that some cause absolutely unknown to us, perhaps nothing more unusual than a change of residence, obliged by private circumstances, took her from Achaia to Italy. She had been a devoted, and it would seem particularly a brave, friend of converts in trouble, and of St. Paul himself. Perhaps in the course of her visits to the desolate, she had fought difficult battles of protest, where she found harshness and oppression. Perhaps she had pleaded the forgotten cause of the poor with a woman's courage before some neglectful richer brother. Then Rome itself, as he sees Phoebe reaching it, rises. As yet only in fancy, it was still unknown to him upon his mind. And there, moving up and down, in that strange and almost awful world, he sees one by one the members of a large group of his personal Christian friends, and his beloved Aquila and Prisca are most visible of all. These must be individually saluted. What the nature of these friendships was, we know in some instances, for we are told here, but why the persons were at Rome, in the place which Paul himself had never reached, we do not know, nor ever shall. Many students of the epistle, it is well known, find a serious difficulty in the list of friends so placed, the persons so familiar, the place so strange, and they would have us look on the 16th chapter as a fragment from some other letter, pieced in here by mistake, or what not. But no ancient copy of the epistle gives us, by its condition, any real ground for such conjunctures. And all that we have to do to realize possibilities in the actual features of the case is to assume that many at least of this large Roman group, as surely Aquila and Prisca, had recently migrated from the Levant to Rome, a migration as common and almost as easy then as is the modern influx of foreign denizens to London. Bishop Lightfoot, in an excursus in his edition of the Philippian Epistle, has given us reason to think that not a few of the Romans named here by St. Paul were members of that household of Caesar, of which in later days he speaks to the Philippians, 422, as containing its saints, saints who send special greetings to the Macedonian brethren. The Domus Caesaris included the whole of the imperial household, the meanest slaves, as well as the most powerful courtiers, all persons in the emperor's service, whether slaves or freemen, in Italy and even in the provinces. The literature of sepulchral inscriptions at Rome is particularly rich in allusions to members of the household, and it is from this quarter, particularly from discoveries in it made early in the last century, that Lightfoot gets good reasons for thinking that in Philippians 4.22, we may quite possibly be reading a greeting from Rome, sent by the very person, speaking roundly, who are here greeted in the epistle to Rome. A place of burial on the Appian Way, devoted to the ashes of imperial freedmen and slaves, and other similar receptacles, all to be dated with practical certainty about the middle period of the first century, yield the following names. Amplius, Urbanus, Stachus, Apellus, Tryphena, Tryphosa, Rufus, Hermes, Hermas, Philologus, Julius Nereus, a name which might have denoted the sister, see verse 15, of a man Nereus. Of course, such facts must be used with due reserve in inference, but they make it abundantly clear that, in Lightfoot's words, the names and allusions at the close of the Roman Empire are in keeping with the circumstances of the metropolis in St. Paul's day. They help us to a perfectly truth-like theory. We have only to suppose that among St. Paul's converts and friends in Asia and Eastern Europe, many either belonged already to the ubiquitous household or entered it after conversion, as purchased slaves or otherwise, and that sometime before our epistle was written, there was a large draft from the provincial to the metropolitan department, and that thus, when St. Paul thought of personal Christian friends at Rome, he would happen to think mainly of saints of Caesar's household. Such a theory would also, by the way, help to explain the emphasis with which just these saints sent their greeting later to Philippi. Many of them might have lived in Macedonia, and particularly in the Colonia of Philippi, before the time of their supposed transference to Rome. We may add from Lightfoot's discussion a word about the households or people of Aristobulus and Narcissus mentioned in the greetings before us. It seems at least likely that the Aristobulus of the epistle was a grandson of Herod the Great and brother of Agrippa of Judea, a prince who lived and died at Rome. At his death, it would be no improbable thing that his household should pass by legacy to the emperor, while they would still, as a sort of clan, keep their old master's name. Aristobulus's servants, probably many of them Jews, 
Herodion, St. Paul's kinsman, may have been a retainer of this Herod, would thus now be a part of the household of Caesar, and the Christians among them would be a group of the household saints. As to the Narcissus of the epistle, he may well have been the all-powerful freedman of Claudius, put to death early in Nero's time. On his death, his great familia would become, by confiscation, part of the household, and its Christian members would have been thought of by St. Paul as among the household saints. Thus it is at least possible that the holy lives which here pass in such rapid file before us were lived not only in Rome, but in a connection more or less close with the service and business of the court of Nero. So freely does grace make light of circumstance. Now it is time to come from our preliminaries to the text. Verse 1 to verse 2. But, the word may mark the movement of thought from his own delay in reaching them to Phoebe's immediate coming. I commend to you Phoebe, our sister. This Christian woman bore without change and without reproach the name of the moon goddess of the Greeks. Being a ministrant of the church which is in Kencria, the Aegean port of Corinth, that you may welcome her in the Lord as a fellow member of his body, in a way worthy of the saints, with all the respect and the affection of the gospel, and that you may stand by her in any matter in which she may need you, stranger as she will be at Rome. For she, on her part, has proved a standby, almost a champion, one who stands up for others, brostadis, of many, I and of me among them. Verse 3 to verse 5. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus, the friends who, for my life's sake, submitted their own throat to the knife. It was at some stern crisis otherwise utterly unknown to us, but well known in heaven. To whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the nations. For they saved the man whom the Lord consecrated to the service of the Gentile world. And the church at their house greet with them that is, the Christians of their neighborhood, who used Aquila's great room as their house of prayer, the embryo of our parish or distinct church. This provision of a place of worship was an old usage of this holy pair, whom St. Paul's almost reverent affection presents to us in such a living individuality. They had gathered a domestic church at Corinth not many months before, 1 Corinthians 16.19, and earlier still at Ephesus, Acts 18.26, they wielded such a Christian influence that they must have been a central point of influence and gathering there also. In Prisca, or Priscilla, as it has been remarked, we have an example of what a married woman may do for the general service of the church in conjunction with home duties, just as Phoebe is the type of the unmarried servant of the church, or deaconess. Greet Eponetus, my beloved, who is the firstfruits of Asia, that is, of the Ephesian province, unto Christ, doubtless one who owed his soul to St. Paul in that three years' missionary pastorate at Ephesus, and who is now bound to him by the indescribable tie which makes the converter and converted one. Verse 6. Greet Mary, a Jewess probably, Miriam or Maria, for she toiled hard for you, when and how we cannot know. Verse 7. Greet Andronicus and Junius, Junianus, my kinsman, and my fellow captives in Christ's war, a loving and mindful reference to the human relationships which so freely but not lightly he had sacrificed for Christ, and to some persecution battle, was it at Philippi, when these good men had shared his prison, men who are distinguished among the apostles, either as being themselves in a secondary sense devoted apostles, Christ's missionary delegates, though not of the apostolate proper, or as being honoured above the common for their toil and their character by the apostolic brotherhood, who also before me came to be as they are in Christ. Not improbably, these two early converts helped to goad, Acts 26.14, the conscience of their still persecuting kinsmen, and to prepare the way of Christ in his heart. Verse 8 to verse 10. Greet Amplius. Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord, surely a personal convert of his own. Greet Urbanus, my co-worker in Christ, and Stachus, another masculine name, my beloved. Greet Apellus, that tested man in Christ. The Lord knows, not we, the tests he stood. Greet those who belong to Aristobulus's people. Verse 11 to verse 12. Greet Herodian, my kinsman. Greet those who belong to Narcissus's people, those who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa almost certainly by the type of their names of female slaves, 
who toil in the Lord, perhaps as servants of the church, so far as earthly service would allow them. Greet Persis, the beloved woman, with faultless delicacy. He does not here say, my beloved, as he said of the Christian men mentioned just above, for she toiled hard in the Lord, perhaps at some time when St. Paul had watched her in a former and more eastern home. Verse 13. Greet Rufus, just possibly the Rufus of Mark 15.21, brother of Alexander and son of cross-carrying Simon, the family was evidently known to St. Mark, and we have good cause to think that St. Mark wrote primarily for Roman readers. Rufus, the chosen man in the Lord, a saint of the elite, and his mother, and mine. This nameless woman had done a mother's part somehow and somewhere to the motherless missionary, and her loving kindness stands recorded now, in either book of life, here and above. Verse 14. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegion, Hermas, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them, dwellers perhaps in some isolated and distant quarter of Rome, a little church by themselves. Verse 15, greet Philologus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and all the saints who are with them in their assembly. Verse 16, greet one another with a sacred kiss, the oriental pledge of friendship and of respect. All, read, passe, the churches of Christ greet you, Corinth, Cenchrea, with all the saints in the whole of Archaea, 2 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. The roll of names is over, with its music, that subtle characteristic of such recitations of human personalities, and with its moving charm for the heart, due almost equally to our glimpses of information about one here and one there, and to our total ignorance about others, an ignorance of everything about them, but that they were at Rome, and that they were in Christ. We seem, by an effort of imagination, to see as through a bright cloud, the faces of the company, and to catch the far-off voices. But the dream dissolves in wrecks. We do not know them, we do not know their distant world, but we do know him in whom they were and are, and that they have been with him which is far better, for now so long a time of rest and glory. Some, no doubt, by deaths of terror and wonder, by the fire, by the horrible wild beasts, departed to be with him. Some went, perhaps, with a dismissal as gentle as love and stillness could make it. But, however, they were the Lord's, they are with the Lord, and we in him are tending upward too as fast as time can move. So we watch this unknown yet well-beloved company with a sense of fellowship and expectation impossible out of Christ. This page is no mere relic of the past, it is a list of friendships to be made hereafter and to be possessed forever in the endless life where personality indeed shall be eternal, but where also the union of personalities in Christ shall be beyond our utmost present thought. But the Apostle cannot close with these messages of love. He remembers another and anxious need, a serious spiritual peril in the Roman community. He has not even alluded to it before, but it must be handled however briefly now. Verse 17 to verse 20. But I appeal to you, brethren, to watch the persons who make the divisions and the stumbling blocks you know of, alien to the teaching which you learnt. There is an emphasis on you, as if to difference the true-hearted converts from these troublers. And do turn away from them. Go, and keep out of their way, wise counsel for a peaceable but effectual resistance. For such people are not bondservants of our Lord Jesus Christ, but they are bondservants of their own belly. They talk much of a mystic freedom, and free indeed they are from the accepted dominion of the Redeemer, but all the more they are enslaved to themselves, and by their pious language and their specious pleas they quite beguile the hearts of the simple, the unsuspicious. And they may perhaps have special hopes of beguiling you, because of your well-known readiness to submit, with the submission of faith to sublime truths, a noble character, but calling inevitably for the safeguards of intelligent caution." For your obedience, the obedience of faith, shown when the gospel reached you, was carried by report to all men, and so to these beguilers, who hope now to entice your faith astray. As regards you, therefore, looking only at your personal condition, I rejoice. Only I wish you to be wise as to what is good, but uncontaminated by defiling knowledge as to what is evil. He would not have their holy readiness to believe, distorted into an unhallowed and falsely tolerant curiosity. He would have their faith not only submissive, but spiritually intelligent. Then they would be alive to the risks of a counterfeited and illusory gospel. They would feel, as with an educated Christian instinct, where decisively to hold back, where to refuse attention to unwholesome teaching. 
but the God of our peace will crush Satan down beneath your feet speedily. This spiritual mischief writhing itself like the serpent of paradise into your happy precincts is nothing less than a stratagem of the great enemy's own, a movement of his mysterious personal antagonism to your Lord and to you, his people. But the enemy's conqueror, working in you, will make the struggle short and decisive. Meet the inroad in the name of him who has made peace for you and works peace in you, and it will soon be over. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be, or may we not render, is with you. What precisely was the mischief? Who precisely were the dangerous teachers spoken of here so abruptly and so urgently by St. Paul? It is easier to ask the question than to answer it. Some expositors have sought a solution in the 14th and 15th chapter and have found in an extreme school of theoretical liberty these men of pious language and specious pleas. But to us this seems impossible. Almost explicitly in those chapters he identified himself in principle with the capable. Certainly there is not a whisper of horror as regards their principle and nothing but a friendly while unreserved reproof for the uncharity of their practice. Here he has in his mind men whose purposes and whose teachings are nothing but evil, who are to be not indeed persecuted, but avoided, not met in conference, but solemnly refused a further hearing. In our view, the case was one of embryo Gnosticism. The Romans, so we take it, were troubled by teachers who used the language of Christianity, saying much of redemption and of emancipation and something of Christ and of the Spirit, but all the while they meant a thing totally different from the gospel of the cross. They meant by redemption and freedom the liberation of spirit from matter. They meant by Christ and the Spirit mere links in a chain of phantom beings supposed to span the gulf between the absolute unknowable existence and the finite world. And their morality, too, often tended to the tenant that, as matter was hopelessly evil, and spirit the unfortunate prisoner in matter, the material body had nothing to do with its unwilling and pure inhabitant. Let the body go its own evil way and work out its base desires. Our sketch is taken from developed Gnosticism, such as it is known to have been a generation or two later than St. Paul. But it is more than likely that such errors were present in essence all through the apostolic age, and it is easy to see how they could from the first disguise themselves in the special terminology of the gospel of liberty and of the spirit. Such things may look to us, after 1800 years, only like fossils of the old rocks. They are indeed fossil specimens, but of existing species. The atmosphere of the Christian world is still infected from time to time, perhaps more now than a few generations ago, whatever that fact may mean, with unwholesome subtleties in which the purest forms of truth are indescribably manipulated into the deadliest related error, a mischief sure to betray itself, however, where the man tempted to parley with it is at once wakeful and humble by some fatal flaw of pride or of untruthfulness or of an uncleanness, however subtle. And for the believer so tempted under common circumstances, there is still, as of old, no counsel more weighty than St. Paul's counsel here. If he would deal with such snares in the right way, he must turn away from them. He must turn away to the Christ of history. He must occupy himself anew with the primeval gospel of pardon, holiness, and heaven. Is the letter to be closed here at last? Not quite yet, not until one and then another of the gathered circle has committed his greetings to it. And first comes up the dear Timotheus, the man nearest of all to the strong heart of the apostle. We see him alive before us, so much has St. Paul in one epistle and another, but above all in his dying letter to Timotheus himself, contributed to a portrait. He is many years younger than his leader and Christian father. His face, full of thought, feeling, and devotion, is rather earnest than strong but it has the strength of patience and of absolute sincerity and of rest in Christ. Timotheus repays the affection of Paul with unwavering fidelity, and he will be true to the end to his Lord and Redeemer, through whatever tears and agonies of sensibility. Then Lucius will speak perhaps the Cyrenian of Antioch, Acts 13.1, and Jason, perhaps the convert of Thessalonica, Acts 17.5 and Sosipater, perhaps the Berean Sopater of Acts 24, three blood relations of the Apostle, who was not left utterly alone of human affinities, though he had laid them all at his master's feet. 
Then the faithful Tertius claims the well-earned privilege of writing one sentence for himself, and Gaius modestly requests his salutation, and Erastus, the man of civic dignity and large affairs, he has found no discord between the tenure of a great secular office and the life of Christ, but today he is just a brother with brethren, named side by side with the Quartus, whose only title is the beautiful one, the brother, our fellow in the family of God. So the gathered friends speak each in his turn to the Christians of the city. We listen as the names are given. Verse 21 to verse 22. There greets you, Timotheus, my fellow worker, and Lucius, and Jason, and Sosipatris, my kinsmen. There greets you, I, Tertius, who wrote the epistle in the Lord. He had been simply Paul's conscious pen, but also he had willingly drawn the strokes as being one with Christ, and as working in his cause. Verse 23. There greets you Gaius, host of me and of the whole church, universal welcomer to his door of all who love his beloved Lord, and now particularly of all at Corinth who need his Lord's apostle. There greets you Erastus, the treasurer of the city, and Quartus, Curatos, the brother. Here, as we seem to discern the scene, there is indeed a pause, and what might look like an end. Tertius lays down the pen, the circle of friends breaks up, and Paul is left alone, alone with his unseen Lord, and with that long, silent letter, his own, yet not his own. He takes it in his hands to read, to ponder, to believe, to call up again the Roman converts so dear, so far away, and to commit them again for faith and for life to Christ and to his Father. He sees them beset by the encircling masses of pagan idolatry and vice, and by the embittered Judaism which meets them at every turn. He sees them unhindered by their own mutual prejudices and mistakes, for they are sinners still. Lastly, he sees them approached by this serpentine delusion of an unhallowed mysticism, which would substitute the thought of matter for that of sin, and reverie for faith, and an unknowable somewhat inaccessible to the finite for the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he sees this astonishing gospel whose glorious outline and argument he has been caused to draw, as it were never drawn before, on those papyrus pages, the truth of God, not of man, veiled so long, promised so long, known at last, the gospel which displays the sinner's peace and believer's life, the radiant, boundless future of the saints, and, in all and above all, the eternal love of the Father and the Son. In this gospel, his gospel, he sees manifested afresh his God, he adores him afresh and commits to him afresh these dear ones of the Roman mission. He must give them one word more to express his overrunning heart. He must speak to them of him who is almighty for them, against the complex might of evil. He must speak of that gospel in whose lines the almighty grace will run. It is the gospel of Paul, but also, and first, the proclamation made by Jesus Christ of himself as our salvation. It is the secret, hushed, throughout the long eons of the past, but now spoken out indeed, the message which the Lord of ages, choosing his hour aright, now imperially commands to be announced to the nations, that they may submit to it and live. It is the vast fulfillment of those mysterious scriptures which are now the credentials and the watchword of its preachers. It is the supreme expression of the soul and eternal wisdom, clear to the intellect of the heaven-taught child, more unfathomable even to the heavenly watchers than creation itself. To the God of this gospel he must now entrust the Romans in the glowing words in which he worships him through the Son in whom he has seen and praised. To this God, while the very language is broken down by its own force, he must give glory everlasting for his gospel and for himself. He takes the papers and the pen, with dim eyes and in large laborious letters, and forgetting at the close in the intensity of his soul to make perfect the grammatical connection. He inscribes in the twilight this most wonderful of doxologies. Let us watch him to its close, and then in silence leave him before his Lord and ours. Verse 25 to verse 27. But to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the proclamation of made by Jesus Christ, true to the unveiling of the secret, hushed in silence during ages of times, but manifested now, and through the prophetic scriptures, according to the edict of the God of ages, for faith's obedience published among all the nations, to God only wise, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory unto the ages of the ages. Amen. End of chapter 32
End of the Epistle of St. Paul to the Romans by Handley Mole.